You folks are in for a real treat today. A few weeks ago, I was invited to spend some time with someone I've been a fan of for several years now, Cowboy Kent Rollins. I took a trip up to Wellington, Texas, where Kent and his wife Shannon have a coffee shop right down there on the town square. We were able to spend a few hours together during that visit, and I was really able to learn a lot about Kent and his wife, his career, his successes, and even a few surprises. Now, Ken has a lot of stories to tell, and due to the length of this video, I'm really gonna have to break it up into two parts. And this is gonna be part one, and I'm gonna post part two next Friday at 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. Hello, and welcome to Grilling and Chilling with Coleman. And today I'm out here with one of my YouTube heroes. And if you don't recognize this gentleman, you should, because I guarantee you all of my viewers definitely listen to and subscribe to his channel. This is Mr. Kent Rollins. And if you don't subscribe to his channel, I'll put a link below. So Ken, thank you very much oh, for having Coleman. me out here and it visiting is, with me today. It is my pleasure, my friend. Thank you for dropping in. And it's uh, good to be in air conditioning. Definitely. You know, air conditioner is a great thing this time of year. And uh, we just uh, so glad that you dropped by. But uh, me and you have a lot in common. We, we, love, we love to eat and we both love the Gila wilderness. Definitely, definitely. Good country. Certainly. Now, uh, you know, you've been on you've been on TV, you've been on the Food Network channel. You, of course, everybody knows you've been on YouTube for years. What are some of the uh, some of the, the shows that you've done on on the Food Network? Oh, the first one was many many years ago. We did a deal it was called Roker on the Road with Al Roker, and uh, he's talking about our cooking schools that we used to do. And uh, it was so hot that day that Al voiced over his deal. He didn't even show up. You know, it was 99 degrees. Uh, but from there, it sort of rocked along. It wasn't long after that. I guess the next one was probably uh, Throwdown with Bobby Flay. You okay. Know, chicken fried steak. And uh, I, I didn't know he was coming. You know, it's, it's, it's really a surprise. And uh, when he showed up that day, it was another one of them good hot days in July. You know, down there, we was on a ranch in North Texas at the time. And, it was about 98 degrees, and he walked in there, and he said, hey, I hear you make the best chicken fried steak in the world. And I said, I don't know about that, but I've had a lot of practice, you know. He said, well, I'll bet you mine is better than you. And he said, I, I, I want to challenge you today. And I said, right here in my kitchen. And he said, yeah. I said, welcome to the land of hot and heavy, my friend. You fit and find <laughs> out, you know. And I told Shan, I said, we'll see how tough he is. And uh, that old wood stove, Bertha, I put all the wood in there she could stand, and then I put him right down there by the hottest end of it. And then right between one of them deals, they took a little break, and he looked at me, and he said, I don't know why in the hell anybody wants your job. And I said, it's job security. Nobody <laughs> wants right. it. You know? That's right. But he was a good sport, um, and it, it was a good deal. I think that sort of opened the eyes up on a lot of the Food Network people. And uh, the next one was Chop Grill Masters, which was probably one of the biggest and the best things that I like to do. Uh, very very nerve wracking in a way, right. you know, they took 16, well, let me rephrase this. They took 15 chefs from across the United States and one cowboy. And uh, Shandice told me, she said, just make it through one round, have a good time. You know, and she said, it's live fire, everything will be fine. And I didn't know half the food they pulled out of that basket, you know, never seen it in my life, couldn't spell it anyway. But um, I thought, just cook like you always do. Uh, just, just fill up a fire, feel the warmth, smell the smoke, and just cook. And, and then I just went to thinking, hey, this is just like anything else. They just got different ingredients, right. you know. And Clams. I remember yeah. I was watching that show. Yeah. Clams, and I remember tofu. They, tofu was one of the worst ones, but uh, I'd never seen a clam in my life. And they give them to me, and I'm thinking, I don't know what you do with them, you know, but I'm going to throw them out there in the fire. Something's going to happen, you know, <laughs> and it did. But uh, it was a great deal. I mean, that's really probably what... Uh, helped us get with our book agent that we are now. Uh, we have her, Janice, up in New York City. Um, got two cookbooks that are out. Uh, fixed to sign the contract for the third one. But uh, after that, they kept asking me, and, and I, the chop people are great. I've known Vivian and all the crew for years and years, and they called and, <clears throat> and they said, hey, we'd like for you to do Chop Redemption. And I said, I'm about chopped out. <laughs> they said, no, just think about it. So I I called Beth back about two weeks, and I said, all right, I'll come, Beth. She said, what changed your mind? And I said, well, i just like to prove to people whether you're outside or inside, I can cook. Don't mm -hmm. make me no difference, you know. And 
ended up getting second again. And I told Shannon, I said, second is, I guess, as high as I'm supposed to be, you know. And, uh, but I remember my daddy told me one time, he said, a lot of times in life, nobody remembers who won first, but they do remember who won second, mm -hmm. you know. And we cook every day like it's the best day of our life. And uh, we enjoy it. God give us a talent, and we just try to share it with people. Certainly. Now, I was, I was reading a story about Chopped Redemption. <clears throat> And I, I did I couldn't find the episode to actually yeah. watch it, but I read something about you cutting your finger. Yeah, it was in the very first round, and uh, they had a guy on there. And we, me and him, were totally opposite. Jeff Ings is name. He's a chef up in uh, Boston, and good person. He's got a orange mohawk that's about this okay. tall, and he's got a smile this big. He's got one of the biggest hearts I've ever seen in a person. And uh, we said later on, you know what? When you look at us, you'd think them two don't go together. You know, we've been friends ever since. And uh, we got in there that morning, and, and they had some of the worst ingredients I've ever seen in my life. You know, there was, um, I can't remember the name of it now, but it was in a can. And we were supposed to fix some kind of appetizer out of it. <clears throat> and they didn't, they took all the can openers, you know. There wasn't none there. So I just, always, you got to carry three knives. Okay. I took a hash knife. Just an old hunting knife mm -hmm. and then a pretty good knife. You know, well, I just took that old buck knife, stabbed it in that can, was opened it. And there was a guy beside me who really didn't like me in the first place. He looked over at me and he said, I don't know how we're going to get in this. And I said, You can borrow my knife here. He said, Ain't everybody a barbarian like you? And I said, Yeah, this will be good. You know, well, I cut it that round. I don't even remember. I think it was that finger there. Mm -hmm. And he always stopped, put a band aid on it, you put a rubber glove on it, you know. If you got it on the cutting board, you turn the board over. Well, we'd done all that. Went through the middle round, and I was still there. Ended up going to the finals, and uh, was having, we had some kind of mango, and then there was this bubble tea, which was the nastiest stuff I ever tried to, to drink in my life. And I, you had to use, use some of it or a little bit of it. It didn't matter how much, you know. So I thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and I'm going to make sort of like a bread pudding, um, sort of like a bread pudding custard cross, you know, and put a little of this bubble tea in it. And, bubble uh, tea. And I got it got it all done, got it ready, and I looked down, and there was blood on my finger where it, it opened back up, you know. And just a little old nick. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went back over, changed dishes, got everything, redone everything, put it all back in there, put it in the oven. But I remember coming back out there, <clears throat> and they – this gal that was there, me and her didn't see eye to eye neither. And uh, they told her they, I mean, they chastised her dessert like it was the worst thing they ever seen in your life. So you know how sometimes in your mind you don't really think about what's going on, but your brain kicks in and it tells you, hey, you, you're going to do all right here, you know. But then you remember it ain't, it ain't about just doing all right. You just want to make sure that you get across the best dish that you can to present to somebody. And I'm thinking, you know, I might have won one. And uh, about that time, Ted looked over there at me, old Ted Allen. He said, uh, Chef Kent, we got a problem. He said, you know, you you contaminated your food. And uh, I said, no, I changed plates, changed this. And Vivian, Vivian, the producer, she looked at me and she said, Kent, we got it on video. I said, well, ma'am, y'all done saddled this horse up. I said, it suits me. You know, whatever y'all think will be good. So they sent us back in that room to deliberate again, you know. And uh, we come back out, well, that little old gal wanted, I knew she would. But uh, I remember telling Shan after it was over, because your day starts about 5 in the morning. And I got back to motel that night at 11.30, you know, because all wow. the interviews and everything else. And Shan said, how you feel? I said, physically wore out, mentally gone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so quick, it's so fast. And I told her what happened, and she said, you all right? And I said, I will be. You know, you, you give you give something in life your best shot as much as, I mean, just all you got every day, you know, and then you get close. And I got close, it chopped. You know, right. $50,000 was right there, and then it was gone due to a sardine. And, uh, and I learned a lot from that, but doing it again, and I, I thought, you know, God didn't intend for me to win first. God intended me f to show up, have manners, have a good time, and show people what it was like to be, just an old cowboy. Certainly. And that's all I've ever wanted to be, cowboy and a cook. Perfect. Perfect. So what is one of your earliest memories of, of cooking? Oh, eight years old in my mother's little old bitty kitchen, and we never had much. We was poor as dirt. And uh, she said, we're going to make chocolate cake. 
We call it ain't always chocolate cake. And I, she said, you're going to make it. And I said, this will be good. So I ended up making that chocolate cake, standing on a stool where I could get over, the, mm-hmm. you know, over where that old mixer was. And I thought, this is the best thing ever. I got to lick the bowl. And then she said, now you can do the dishes. You know, I'm thinking, <laughs> we should have backed up. She should have told me this first. You know, I might have went into being a dentist that, or something right. instead of a cook. But cooking came pretty natural uh, for me. Uh, I remember Food Network asked me one time in an interview they were doing, what, ins- what chefs inspired you to mm-hmm. cook? And I said, they never had that title. It was mother, aunt, mm-hmm. grandma, some old timer on a ranch, Certainly. you know. And I said, my mother told me, you, you cook with your hands because they're an extension of your heart. Definitely. And that's, that's the only way I've ever known how to cook. And um, I, I appreciate the, and I thank God for the way I was raised with my mother and my father. And I got taught the, surely the basics of life. Mm-hmm. But my, my mother always told me too, and we're a firm believer in it today, and I tell this to a lot of folks, you gather food on the table, it brings people together. Definitely. And the legs of the table ain't what hold it up. It's people around it. Certainly. And um, food is meant to bring people together. It heals wounds. It makes people happy. And, uh, hey, that's what we try to do every day. 100%. You know, and one of my earliest memories is my nanny. It wasn't a chef. It was my nanny. She was actually the camp cook at yeah. Ladder Ranch in New Mexico. Yeah. I don't know if you heard of Ladder yeah. Ranch. It was owned later by, I'm not going to mention his name. I yeah. had a lot of respect for the guy. But, but she was the camp cook at Ladder Ranch. And I remember her standing around cooking chicken fried steak, you know, just like you do. Yep. Um, never knew what kind of meat was going in there because we lived out on the ranch and it could yep. have been roadkill or it could have been <laughs> yeah. could have been beef. Never knew uh, what was going into that's it. That's right. But uh, she was my inspiration. Yep. So um, I, I've heard you talk about your early days of camp cooking in the Gila. Yeah. Being I, I'm from the Gila and my, my grandparents grew up in Silver City. My parents were married in Silver City and I still go back there every year. I'd love to hear about the early years. Oh, uh, it was... Uh, you know, my, my mother's brother, uh, his name was Harry Newton Van Osdale Jr. He had a long title, and, uh, but they called him Uncle Duck. And uh, he was got back out of the Army, and he just moved back up there in Gila, mm-hmm. you know. And, uh, he was sort of a loner, didn't like to be around a lot of people. Uh, he loved mules, and he loved dogs, and he loved wide open country, and um uh, that's one of the first wildernesses that was put in, you know, with Roosevelt so many years ago. And uh, he called one time and he said, say, I'm going to need some help this fall, hunters. And I said, I'll see how much time I got. He said, need about six weeks. And I said, I'll just have to see. He said, I, I need some help with some hunters and I need to cook. I know you know how to cook. And I said, how about you cook? And he said, I don't cook, you know. So we got out there and uh, went to Campbell Station. I know you know where that's at, you know. we because we went on that side and went to Lily Park, which is about 25 miles in. And we did that to, so you weed out some of the people, you know, when you go that deep into Definitely. a wilderness, especially if it's on a mule or a horse. And we'd always tell people, uh, if you think you know how to ride, practice where you get here, you know. Uh, it's a long journey into camp, and uh, it's always uh, a good time. But I, I remember some of the folks that you'd see at the trailhead early in the morning. And uh, my uncle, he was, he was pretty hard. Uh, they could be a man and a woman get out of a vehicle. And he'd say, I got him. You know? <laughs> and he'd pack his stuff. He'd go to camp. You know? And I remember we had this little gal in there from Georgia named Wanda. And she's not much taller than Shan. She might have been five foot at the most. Well, I had three or four different saddles, and I'd put her in something that had the shortest stirrup length I could mm-hmm. get, you know, and still wasn't just a fit. We took off, got about four miles down the trail, and she hollered at me. She said, Mr. Rollins, I can't go no farther. I said, Wanda, we like 21 miles. <laughs> I said, Dark is going to get us, I promise you. And she said, I can't ride anymore. And I said, well, ma'am, we ain't going to pitch camp here. And she looked at me, and she said, you don't worry about me. I'll trot along beside. I said, ma'am. Georgia is not near the elevation that this is. She said, you don't worry about it. I'll be there. And Coleman, I don't know if this lady had trained for marathons or what, but every time I look back, she was right there. Wow. 21 miles. Kept right she'd up. come into camp. You know, and it, you know, I mean, you're going in, you ain't at a full lope. You ain't mm-hmm. barely at a trot, sometimes a walk. And I'd always stop and I'd say, Wanda, you all right? I'm going to make it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make it. And I thought, you know, next, in the morning, I'm going to sleep in. Mm-hmm. She'll be tired and sore. She was going to help me cook breakfast at 2.15 that wow. morning, you know. And, uh, 
But the Hilo sort of sort of grew on me. That's it's not such a thick. I mean, there's parts of it like at Lily Park where we were. There's a beautiful meadow right down there below Lily Mountain, you know, and um, it was sort of you could get deep in the woods there. You could. But there were so many wide open spots that was in the crest of them valleys and every place else, and uh, fell in love with it. Um, I always knew God created so much stuff that you could see. And I just never had got to see all of it. Certainly. You know, and that Gila is, if people hadn't been, they need to go because uh, there's a lot of great history there. Gorgeous. But man, it is some beautiful country, and I'd love to be there in September when they will bugle. Right. And, uh, one of my favorite places to be. We've we've got some property there in, outside of Kamado. Yeah, it's over. It's actually over the mountain from Kamado Lake, twenty miles in on a logging road back in there, and overlooking this huge meadow. And and I remember, you know, it's been in the family for about thirty years. And I remember sometimes getting up in the morning and going out on the front porch, and there'd be three hundred elk just walking through the meadow. And yeah. you know, we were out there oh, a couple of years ago, and my wife and I are just sitting out there. We're making making breakfast on the campfire. And a big old wolf just about 150 yards just runs across the meadow. And you don't get to see those kind of no, things no, they, you know, living in the city. They, there's a lot of things out there that people don't get to see very right. often. And um, it's, uh, it's it's very different to cooking conditions like that, too. I mean, I've cooked at sea level and I've cooked at 12,000 foot. Mm -hmm. And uh, first time I ever cooked in any elevation at all was in the Gila in about 82. Um, I couldn't even know why biscuits wouldn't rise, you know. I remember making sourdough biscuits, and they'd be a bit like this, you know. <laughs> One of them, I said, uh, is this flatbread? I said, you can call it whatever you want to, brother. I said, but ain't nobody else here going to feed you, you know. Well, then I, everything I usually learned from cooking something in a Dutch oven was trial and error. Mm -hmm. I never had a teacher. And, uh, and it's sure, there's a lot of similarities between cooking in the house and cooking outside, but when you're in Mother Nature's kitchen, she's always in control. Definitely. Wind going to blow, going to rain, going to snow. Elevation, you want it to rise? Baking soda, baking powder combined. You know, uh, it's one of them things I finally figured out. When, at the end of that hunt, one of them hunters looked at me and he said, where'd you get these biscuits at? And I said, <laughs> I went to McDonald's, rode over the hill and got them, you know. But uh, you always learn something from every fire you build. Definitely, definitely. I remember one year we're cooking and camping out there on top of Mount Taylor. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was 13 degrees, trying to make pancakes, and the pancake batter's yeah. freezing. And we had to put put the pancake batter in a bowl of bo boiling water just to keep it from freezing so yep. we can make a pancake. So, um, you know, you've, you've mentioned several times about your faith. And and I, I'd like to hear more about that and, 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 and kind of, you know, where you got started. And, and, and was that something you, you know, that was taught to you as a child or did you find your faith later in life? Or No. You know, uh, you were born with faith in mm -hmm. our country. Uh, my mom and my dad went through the Dust Bowl. And uh, he was six, seven years old. And he said, you heard the movie True Grit. Mm -hmm. He said, we actually got it. You know, I put grit in your heart and grit in your teeth both. He said, a lot of people didn't make it. A lot of people moved on. But he said, we knew that we couldn't rely on us. We had to rely on God mm -hmm. and faith to get us through it. And he said, it's hard. He said, uh, a, lot of, a lot of livestock died. A lot of people died. But he said, you just keep praying for that rain. Certainly. Praying for that cooler weather. Praying for that wind. Just quit, you know. And uh, so I knew that faith was instilled long before I got there, you know. And I, I, rem I can remember when me and Shan first got together, she told me one time, she said, you still have that dust bowl mentality. And I said, yeah, I got a lot of sand in here, probably. And she said, no. She said, you always look at it as it's going to. Not, it's not, you know, and I, and I poured her a cup of coffee one day and I, I poured it half full and I said, half full or half empty? And she said, to you, it's always half full. And I said, in life, it's half full. I said, God can give you the grace and the abundance to drink out of that half full glass from now on and never be empty. That's right. And I said, we can fill it up with just us. It still ain't never full. But I said, if you'll let him pour it, it'll always be full. Absolutely. And uh, she looked at me and she said, you can always make me feel better on the darkest of days. And I said, God, give me a talent. And I said, I don't know if it's cooking, if it's visiting or saying the right words. But I said, I don't know what's going to happen. He does. And I rely on that faith to get me through, whether it's a cooking competition 
or cooking 350 steaks in 110 degree weather or trying to cook 400 when it's minus five, you know. Uh, I said, because he's in control. Certainly. And I said, if you'll let him, he's the greatest cook of all in my book. Definitely. And I said, hey, a lot of stuff I cook, I don't know if me, him, either one would eat, but I said, we've said it out there. Yeah. And I, so faith is, if you don't have faith and you grew up, and especially in this country, uh, and the surroundings and being raised ranch and, and, and on a farm some, you wouldn't make it. Definitely. You know, because uh, there's a lot that's just riding uh, on what faith you have in God that he's going to provide. And, uh, and I can remember every prayer I ever heard as a little child. Every one of them was, Lord, we either th- see, it was either thank you so much for the much needed rain or, Lord, if you just see fit to bless this country with a little water. You know, and I remember them old men sitting out there on the porch, maybe on a Sunday after church or after we got through working cattle sometime during the week. And they, that was the first subject, rain. Right. You know, because that was the life's blood of what they were surrounded in. Definitely. And uh, Daddy always told me, he said, you heard the story about Noah? And I said, yeah. I said, great flood. He said, Noah didn't come by here. He said, we got a half inch. <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said, yeah, I can believe that. But not Faith will get you through there, brother. Certainly. If certainly. you'll turn it over to him. Yep, definitely. You know, one thing I always love about you and your videos is is always the love and respect you're showing for Shannon as well. Yeah. So I like to how'd you two meet? I mean, what's your story? Uh Elko uh Nevada has the largest and the oldest cowboy poetry gathering mm-hmm. in the United States. And they called one year, uh, wanting me to come up there and do a little entertaining and a cooking workshop. And I thought, I ain't never been up in that country. Might be cooler, you know. I'm always looking for a cooler place. When you cook in the hot, you're looking for any place cooler. I cook in Alaska every day if I could. But uh, so they sent me this application. I filled it out. They called me back and said, well, yeah, we'd love for you to come. Uh, We're going to set up this call for you to have so you can go for your workshop. So I called, and this gal answered the phone. She said, this is Shannon. And I she said, I'm here to help you with your workshop, and I need to know what you're going to need. And I said, we're going to do sourdough biscuits uh, demonstration, and the next day we'll do a chicken fried steak demonstration. But I said, for the sourdough, I said, I need a crock jar. And she just went to laughing, you know. And she laughed for a long time, and I'm thinking, man, this gal really thinks I'm funny. You know? <laughs> well, come to find out later, she just laughs when she's nervous. She couldn't understand nothing I was telling her, you know. But, uh. Uh, we, I went up there and we did the workshop. I entertained um, and met a lot of good people, people I hadn't seen in a long time. Uh, but she was just one of them people who made you feel good. Right. You know, her smile was the greatest. Uh, you knew she had a big heart. And we stayed friends for seven, eight years, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, one day out of the blue, I called her and I asked her, I said, would you like to come to cooking school? She said, I think I might. And she said, I I might build a website for you. I said, what? And she said, a website. I said, I ain't never had one of them. And uh, she said, you have an email address? And I said, uh, Route 1, Box 318. She said, no, no, that ain't it. And I said, well, you can see where I'm at, sugar. And uh, she come to cooking school, and she took a bunch of pictures, went home, sort of did a little website. And by that time, I'd got a computer, didn't know how to turn it on. But uh, she helped me through that on the phone. Then we stayed friends and for a little bit longer. And then I called her one day and I said, I think I need you to come back to cooking school, but I actually want you to cook this time, you know? So she came and um, then she ended up coming again, bringing her sister and I finally had to marry her before she could graduate, <laughs> you know? But she, she come from ranching country. Elko is great ranch mm-hmm. country. Uh, and she knew what cooking was. She just never done any of it, you know? And, um, uh, I can remember one of the first times she ever helped me uh, cater a deal. We was cooking for about 300 me and her on the 4th of July in a very hot and humid place north of Oklahoma City. And she said, now, what do you want me to do? I said, you can cook all the bread. I said, I'll do the steaks, the beans, and the dessert, and the potatoes. I said, you just cook the bread. I said, you know how to cook bread. I said, you had a good teacher. And she said, how many ovens of bread is there? I said, eight, eight sixteens. Well, she ain't very big. And... Uh, She'd get hold that lid lifter and, and where I pick it up one hand, mm-hmm. she'd pick right. it up with two, to, you know, to rotate a pot. And um, she said, you're going to help me? And I said, yeah. 
which I knew it wasn't because that's the best way you learn, you know, and I can smell bread if it's burning 20 mm -hmm. miles away. And she knew how many coals to put on it one time. And she said, you didn't intend to help me, did you? And I said, only if you got in a bind. And I said, you never was in a bind. And um, she's been one of my greatest inspirations. She come around in life and time when I really needed to believe that somebody believed in me. Certainly. You know, and she pushed me a little harder at times because I'd sort of come to the point to where, hey, I'm just going to cook for ranches. You know, and I still enjoy that, still do it. But uh, we work together 365 days a year. Uh, you know, she's a great writer, a producer. Uh, but when you can work beside your best friend and she's the one you love in life, every day's a vacation. And that's that's great advice. Oh, it is. Great uh, advice. I, I've never had, a, I ain't had a job, right. you know. Um, and I've seen her, she was on the bail ranch with me the first time we went out there. And uh, she's the first woman to ever cook on the bail ranch off a chuck wagon. Women weren't allowed to camp, you know, some of them deals. And uh, ain't no days off, ain't no spa days. Uh, five and a half weeks, up every morning, 2.15. She never batted an eye. Um, she's a great photographer. But she learned right then, because uh, I'd always told her, I said, this is maybe one of the hardest jobs you'll ever do in life, and sometimes very demanding in some of the worst conditions you can be in. But I said, it is the most rewarding thing you'll ever see. I said, because you're going to see country that God created that nobody's seen much. Exactly. And I said, you're going to meet people who are legends, but nobody knows them. Mm -hmm. And I said, they're salt of the earth people. And I said, one of the greatest things about it out there at the Bell Ranch is, there's no cell phone service. That's right. No computer. Yeah. No nothing. You unplug five and a half weeks. Just you know. stars. And I remember we was at an old camp and the dirt was blowing something awful. It's about 95 degrees. And I looked up, tears running down her face. And uh, she had her back turned to the wind, just like an, an old horse would in a blizzard, you know. And I could tell she was crying because I could see it wash the dirt off her face. And I looked over at her and I said, Sugar, you ain't got to be in this. I said, you get that pickup? run that air conditioner a while. I said, go to headquarters, you know, get out of it. And she just reached up over her shirt, wiped them tears off both eyes and looked at me and she said, this is what we do and we do it better than anybody else. And she said, so you might as well go work. So I got up, Cole, <laughs> yes, back to work. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> but no, nah, it's, uh, I wake up every morning and I tell God, thank you so much for another day and thank you for putting an angel in my life. Sir. Because sure. um, I'm blessed, brother. Definitely. I really hope you've enjoyed this interview with Kent Rollins so far. And as I said before, I'll be posting part two of this interview next Friday. I have links below to Kent's YouTube channel and his website. So pop on over and subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you again for joining me in the GNC kitchen. If you're watching this interview at a later date, I'll post part two to the interview right up here. And I'll also put a link down below in the description. And please like and subscribe right up here. And don't forget to ring that bell down below. It'll let you know when I have new videos coming out. I always enjoy spending time with you in the GNC kitchen and sharing my recipes. Now y'all go grill something.